So we'll get started. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight at a Wednesday with Wanda. I'm so honored to have the opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker. But before I do, I want to explain how tonight's program will work. As we all know, Wanda likes everything to be interactive, and tonight will be no different. We will begin with a short question and answer session on stage between Dr. Wanda Everidge and Mandy McReynolds. We will then open up to the audience for questions. And remember, if no one asks a question, she may call on you. <laughs> then to close the night, Wanda will leave us with her own remarks. Dr. Wanda Everidge, who is better known around Drake's campus as Wanda, has worked here at Drake University for the past 25 years. She holds a bachelor's degree from Drake and earned her master's and PhD from Iowa State University. She was the first recipient of the Madeline M. Levitt Mentor of the Year Award, which represents commitment to student success and excellence in mentoring of students. She's a recipient of the Virgil S. Lago Marcino Lorette Award from Iowa State University, honoring graduates who are nationally and internationally recognized for their service and distinguished achievement in education. Among her many other awards, she has also received the Donald V. Adams Spirit of Drake Award, the Madeline M. Levitt University Employee Excellence Award, the Urban Dreams Trailblazer Award, the Young Women's Resource Center Women of Vision Award, the YMCA Women of Achievement Award, the Alpha Award of Merit from Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, and the Greater Des Moines Leadership Institute Distinguished Education Award. Around Drake, Wanda is known for her blood, sweat, and tears speech during orientation and her wake up with Wanda speech during Welcome Weekend. She serves as a mentor to students, staff, and faculty alike, and is a constant reminder to all of us of what it truly means to put others before yourself. Please join me in welcoming Wanda Everidge and Mandy McReynolds to the stage. Thank you all for joining us this evening. How many of you have ever seen Bravo's The Actors Studio? A few of you? All right. Well, this format is in modeled after James Lipton's work. For those of you who do not know him, what he does is he brings experienced actors and professionals, directors, into a classroom of future students at Pace University in NYC. They have the opportunity to ask questions about what inspired their work, their field, and advice that they would give to future professionals. And of course, they end the evening with the famous 10 questions. <laughs> we will get to those. So this evening, we are delighted at Drake University to invite Dr. Wanda Everidge to serve as our guest speaker. To talk with her about her work and experience before Drake, her time at Drake, and maybe some future aspirations. So, how are you feeling, Wanda? <laughs> I don't necessarily like being on this end, <laughs> uh, but yes, great. It's great to be here. Now, one of the famous things that Rachel Boone said to me this morning was, your chair was sitting out in the hallway, and she took a moment in the chair. And she thought about the years and the tears. If this chair could talk. <laughs> so, this evening, you are sitting in your own chair. Talk with us about some of the things you're thinking about and experiencing right now sitting there. Let me give you a little history about this chair. When I was first asked to come to Drake as an employee. At that time, Dr. John Erickson was the provost. And he had this chair in his office. And when he asked me to consider coming to Drake, I was at Roosevelt High School at the time. I was not thinking about coming back to Drake. As you all know, I'm a Drake graduate. But I sat in this chair, and there was something about sitting in this chair 
And before I knew it, I was saying, yes, I will come to Drake. Well, since then, for over almost 24 years, students have sat in this chair. And I always put a box of tissue because typically when someone sits in this chair, they will say, well, there's nothing wrong. And during orientation, I always love to use this example. And I know we've got some football players in the audience. And please know I'm not picking on football players. Um, but you know, in our society, unfortunately, we still think about the male, the macho male, not crying, not shedding tears when there's something wrong, or even tears of joy. But they will sit in this chair, and they will look around my office, because all of you know my office is located in this building. And they will say, Wanda, uh, can anyone see in here or here? No? You sure? Yeah, I miss my mom. <laughs> so I love that. This chair, I don't care shape, color, size, background. When I see students who are needing and wanting an ear, someone to just listen, I invite them to sit in this chair. So far this year, I've had very few who have taken me up on that offer because they have heard, is that the chair? <laughs> sit, yeah, well, I'm gonna sit at the table because I don't <laughs> wanna sit there. So this chair, John Erickson told me he wanted me to take this home with me. So I am taking the chair, it doesn't match anything in my house, <laughs> but I am taking this chair with me because of its significance. To me, it represents all of you who have spent time with me, even if it hasn't been in my office, but being able to spend quality time with students at Drake, I will always have you in my memory. So this chair is very special. Wanda, can you tell us a little bit about where did life begin for you, and how did that bring you to your collegiate journey at Drake? Life began for me in Alton, Illinois, and I have my brother and my niece in the audience. There is such a place as Alton, Illinois. It does exist. And um, my dad is deceased. My mom is still living, so she will be here this weekend. But um, I was born to Lovey and Ernest Woods. And it's very interesting. I don't mind sharing my journey because a lot of times when people think, and I want you all to take this as an opportunity to reflect on your own lives. This is not just about Wanda. It really is about reflection. So you can have a sense of where you've been and where you want to go. My past consisted of living and growing up in a segregated town where we were not allowed, black people were separated from anyone else. And my parents, my mom came from Mississippi, my dad from Tennessee, and they experienced discrimination on a daily basis. But I can tell you, both of my parents never taught us to hate. They taught us to continue to love, but they taught us to be proud of who we are. My dad only got to about third grade. I think my mom got to about ninth grade but because of discriminatory practices, but they were determined that their three children were going to complete their degrees, that they were going to get a college education, because they taught us early on that what you put in your head, no one, absolutely no one can take that from you. And you will have people who don't like you. You will have people who will feel that you don't belong but you do belong. And I'm not forcing my religious beliefs on anyone, but this is what we were taught. And I never forget, I can still hear my mother's voice when she said, you are God's child. And with God, all things are possible. So never ever let anyone make you feel less than. So I grew up in that kind of environment, but I also grew up in a very loving home. My mom used to always say that what's going on outside in the streets, and I grew up, we grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood, and right now it is rough. So yes, dodging bullets. When you hear the gunfire, you hit the floor. Yes, I understand about that, but she used to always say, but in this house, you are not going to have to experience that. In this house, you are going to experience love. In this house, you are going to be respectful. In this house, 
you are going to learn what it means to work hard and achieve and be proud of yourselves. So that's how we grew up, and understanding the importance of journey. So when I decided that I was going to go to college in Iowa, my father, first of all, didn't want me to go away from home. I was the first, even though I have an older sister, and she graduated from Southern Illinois University. I graduated, of course, from Drake, and my brother graduated from Iowa State University. But when I came here, I was the first to leave home, and he didn't want me to come this far. So when I got here, of, of course, for those of you who know me, you know that was just sort of like, oh, okay, you don't want me to go, Dad. Um, <laughs> so we're going to work this out where I can go. Um, so my mom kind of forged some signatures. Strong Christian woman now, but forged <laughs> her signature. Um, and so I was able to come here to Drake on an academic scholarship, and because I'm not athletic. Um, <laughs> so academic scholarship. And when I arrived on campus, I was incredibly homesick, incredibly homesick, developed serious migraine headaches, um, called my father at one point, especially after a professor here at Drake, made it very clear that he didn't think people of color, and he did not put it that nicely, uh, belonged at Drake. And so I was devastated. It was in a class that I had over in Meredith. And uh, I called my fam family and I said, okay, I want to come home. I, I don't want to deal with this. My father said, once you start something, you will finish. And yes, it's going to be tough, but you wanted to go there and you are going to stay there. Well, I decided and with their cons consultation, I went to every class, went to every class prepared, sat in the front row, raised my hand every chance I could, and he would not call on me until some of my classmates, they were also all white class, I was the only black student in class, and they said, we're not gonna answer until you acknowledge Wanda. I wanna say to all of you, you can make a difference just by taking a stand. Well, to make a long story short, I was able to, I passed that class with an A, and one of the things he said to me, he said, you know, I still don't think you all, you people belong here, but you know something, you earned that A. And I said to him, I'm not expecting you to like me, but respect that I am doing what I need to do. So from that point on, I knew Drake was a place where I needed to be. My journey continued at Iowa State, continued in the Des Moines Public Schools, and here at Drake for 24 plus years, it has been a phenomenal journey. But there have been tough times. There have been tears shed. There have been times where I've wondered, why am I doing this? But when I look at all of you, I know why I'm doing this because you are our future, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to spend quality time with you. Wanda, you reflected a little bit on those collegiate years and your first moments on Drake's campus. Can you speak about another time or moment during those four years at Drake that really influenced your work over the last decade and more here at Drake as a, a professional? Um, I don't know how many of you were at the African American reunion this past weekend, but three of my dear friends, and they were all upper class students, Kitty Weston Nauer, Bobby Dawkins, and Kay Henderson Bain. And they were older, they were two years older, and when I arrived on Drake's campus, I just had my one little trunk. My parents couldn't afford to come with me. So I had my one little trunk with everything that I owned got a cab, came to campus, cab driver dropped me off, and this young woman came bounding down the stairs. She said, you Wanda? I wasn't sure if I should answer, because I didn't know what she wanted. <clears throat> said, yes, she said, welcome. Picked up my trunk single-handedly, took it up on third floor. I lived in Morehouse 318 for four years. Put it down, she said, 
when you get your stuff together, I'm going to come back in a few minutes, and we are going to just go around campus. Then Bobby and Kay came along, and they just took me under their wing. That is why we have a peer mentor program at Drake University. When I came back to work at Drake, and I was looking around, and retention was an issue then, and John Erickson had said, my, my, my job description was, do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> John said, we're having some retention issues, as a lot of colleges and universities were, and continue. And he said, I've heard some things that you've done at Roosevelt High School, so do it. And I mean that. So I loved having that freedom, but in walking around campus, talking with students, it was obvious to me that that peer-to-peer -peer relationship was really important. And all of you know, if you are involved at all in the literature about success in higher education, student success, you will see that peer-to-peer -peer interaction is one of the most powerful tools in terms of student satisfaction. So I thought about, okay, I'm gonna start a peer mentor program. Also, when I was vice principal at Roosevelt High School, I um, had a National Honor Society. So I know we always did a lot of wonderful service projects with ninth graders. The seniors would always help ninth graders. Well, sitting on the steps of Old Main one day, I thought, okay, let's start one. The provost at that time, who was no longer John Erickson, I said, I'd love to start a peer mentor program. He said, sounds good. You have no money. I don't think you're going to get any students who want to participate. But yeah, you can try it. <laughs> okay. So I'm thinking my father didn't want me to come here, and I defied him. So I think I will defy you as well. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I had one young man. He and I were the only two people who planned at that time it was New Student Week. And we were told you'll never get students to volunteer because I very much believe in service. I think it's so important that you give back and charity begins at home. So we were able to get students who volunteered, started the peer mentor program that was 21 years ago and it is going strong. So that to me was something I've had the experience of having people who thought enough of me that they wanted to help me be successful, not put me down, but build me up. There's a saying, and I love this saying, don't look down on a person unless you're picking them up. And that was sort of the philosophy behind that. And then the, the Peer Advisory Board members, I see several of them in the audience now and over the years. I am so proud of that program because you all are making a difference in the lives of young people who are coming, who are homesick, who are wondering whether they're making the right choice or not. And so your being a role model is more than just symbolic. You really are making a difference. But that was something that I'm proud of. So how many of you, we'll put this in the negative tense, have not heard of Wake Up With Wanda? Really? That's what I thought. So Wanda, you have this wonderful platform to talk to everybody about waking up. What wakes you up? Whoa. <laughs> you picked me. Yeah, I did pick you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, I said, um, didn't I? <laughs> but I did not say, like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, so I didn't do that. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, People may think that I'm, I'm, I think most people who know me know I'm very sincere, so I don't say things to make people feel good or actually students, young people. Um, young people have always been my passion, um, especially young people who, who are inspired to do something with their lives, but also 
again, going back to this theme, helping those along the way. Um, what wakes me up is being, which by the way, is at 3.30, between 3.30 and 4 a.m. every morning. And my mom will tell you that I was that way as a baby. She said she has never had to wake me up and she's never had to tell me to go to bed. So, um, but waking up, first of all, throwing those windows open and hearing the birds. They start at my house at 4.10 a.m. Seriously, 4.10 <laughs> a.m. Um, but thinking about my day and whose lives will be touched today by faculty who I just admire because of the opportunity to not only help students think critically, but challenge them. So students who have been in my office before, you know when you come in and you complain about this professor gives you this amount of reading and this paper and you've got all this work, my reaction is always, yes, love it. And I usually get that reaction, I, I thought I was gonna get sympathy, for, uh -uh, not out of me, because I want you to be challenged. So I wake up thinking about ways in which our young people will be challenged here at Drake, when I was other places, was always waking up, how are they gonna be challenged at Roosevelt? When I taught middle school, waking up, just finding the energy. Um, <laughs> so, but love doing what I did then. But yeah, I think the whole notion of waking up, seeing that there is a brighter day. When I went through some very difficult times in my life, um, and those, some of you already know this, when my husband walked off, and left me after being married for 21 years. That was one of the most difficult times in my life when my dad died. That was a very difficult time in my life, but I woke up every morning, so waking up knowing that it could be a brighter day, and I was in charge of my attitude about it. I didn't depend on someone else to make me happy. I had to make that happen for myself, and so young people, being able to come to work. And I, when my husband left, and I don't know if Don Adams is in the office, in the, in the audience, but Don came in one day, and I, no one knew for a whole year that I was going through this, because I did not believe in bringing my problems to work. Don Adams happened to walk into my office one day, and he said, Wanda, are you okay? <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. So that was after a year of that. But, but being able to still function when things are tough. And I know each of you, again, thinking of your own stories and your own reflections of your own lives. I'm not the, I don't have the corner market on having a tough time. I know all of you do, but waking up, recognizing it's a new day and you can make a difference and that life is not done. So being able to say, wake up! with Wanda. I didn't want to leave without, see, those of you who have not been to a welcome weekend, those, I, some of you were bracing yourself, weren't you? Because you knew that was going to happen. But yeah, wake up to the newness, wake up to awareness of the world around you, Work, wake up to possibilities. have you as a leader, and you've worked with as a leader of professionals, as a leader of students, worked to inspire others to follow and be passionate about their work? I think leading by example. Um, I've always believed that, you know, I can say a whole lot of things to you, but you're watching what I do. Um, and if, they're, if those don't go together, then I've lost you. I've lost your trust. Um, so I think leading by example. Um, for those of you who know, I've also been on the Iowa Board of Parole. Spent four, five, four years um, going into all of the prisons in the state of Iowa, interviewing the inmates to determine er early release. And leadership was something that I, I understand from the wardens who used to always tell me, um, this is old home week for you, isn't it? Because when you come in, the and unfortunately, it's not funny, but um, I interviewed 32 of my former students um, when I was on the Iowa Board of Parole. So when I would go in, pri primarily the maximum security prison in Fort Madison, 
and as I say, unfortunately, they would be in the chains and the shackles on the, the legs, and there was average, average, I know you're gonna let me out. I said, no, 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 because you know, I know you, so <laughs> <laughs> just stay put for a while. Uh, <laughs> So, in interjecting that humor and leadership, I'm <laughs> that's a true story too. Tell us how you have worked over the years to maintain and achieve work-life balance. I do not have work-life balance. <laughs> so, But my work blends with my passion. So I don't see them as separate. Um, I've had people ask me, what happens to you in the evenings? Because you sort of drop off and we know nothing about what you do. <laughs> and that's on purpose. That's how I'm able to separate my work from my life. I need my downtime. So if you call me after 9 o'clock, you get a very different Wanda. Um, <laughs> And, and that's 9 p.m. Um, for those of you who are part of CAD, Council of Academic and Administrative Departments, we always laugh and say they see various sides of Wanda. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have balance, but I have a life that I love. So I have my church family, I have my Drake family, of course I have my biological family. They're not here in Iowa, so I'm the only one of my family who's here. But I have balance because I make sure I have balance. When I'm feeling overwhelmed, um, I'll do a lot of reading and meditation. Um, and then when I have the energy, I may be back on campus, you know, doing some things too. So I don't worry so much, and I don't have children of my own. So um, that's something else. To, I would never suggest not having balance, you know, if you have family. But for me, what I do, I love so much that I don't think about not having a balance. Looking back on your 25 plus years of work experience and life experience, what advice would you give to all the students sitting here this evening? Would you repeat the first part of that question, please? Looking back, over on your 25 plus years of work experience, what advice would you give to the students sitting in the audience this evening? Um, first of all, as a student, and you've heard me say this before, soak up all the knowledge you possibly can. I have a purple sponge, and those of you who have been in my first year seminar, no, there's a purple sponge that I keep. Purple representing royalty. You are royal. You have an opportunity that many people don't have to get an outstanding education. Soak up the knowledge, not only when you're sitting in the classroom, but learning from each other and ways in which you engage with the neighborhood, ways in which you engage with the world. And because technology now is a ways, are ways in which you can connect in many different environments. Take advantage of that. Also, I want to encourage you to find your passions. And I say that with plural, passions. Because you will find that work is so much more enjoyable when it's not just about making all the money you possibly can and stepping on people to earn it. That's not going to sustain you any length of time. But if you're doing some things that you love doing, and know that those will change over time, but explore, expand, engage. And I'm gonna challenge you all to do something, and you know this is not new if you've heard me speak to you before. I want you each to become comfortable with difference. Not see it as something that you have to do or you check it off your list. Because ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be successful in this society, and I mean successful, not again, not just about making money, but developing relationships with people all over the world, showing 
that you are not intimidated because of something that's different from what you have experienced and who you are. That's going to set you apart. That's going to make you a strong Drake graduate. The distinctly, distinctly different Drake student is one who can handle difference. And because I so much believe, and when I say difference, I'm not just talking about the physical attributes that make us appear to be different. I am talking about what you value, backgrounds, what you think, how you engage. And that comfort level comes across. So if, again, that those 25 years of being here at Drake, I have seen that evolution. I think you all have more opportunities than many people did several years ago. I'm a little disappointed that you're not really taking advantage of those opportunities and less forced to do so. And it's not just about me or pleasing me, but I want you to know that I speak for many people in this room, as well as in every industry out there in which you will work, that understanding that difference exists and being comfortable with that is going to set you apart. So please engage yourselves in thinking about ways that you can experience difference. You will find that you are so much richer. You are so much more influential without throwing your weight around. You are going to be respected because you're going to empower other people to understand and respect difference. There's a quote, and then I will stop with this. I love the quote. It says, I honor the differences that exist, and I appreciate our oneness. Faculty and staff at Drake, the oneness that we share is Drake University. That's our community. Those are things that we, even though we each have different experiences within this community, our oneness is that. Also, our oneness is how we view the world, and the world is a place where we each belong. One, I say, I promise, one last comment on this. Uh, if you've been in my first year seminar, at least the last five years, we talk about being at home in the universe. What is home? Home is any place where you exist. How are you making that home environment? not only pleasurable for yourselves, but for those around you. Drake students, you are phenomenal. My niece has been with me this whole week. And being able to listen to what she is seeing from the eyes of someone who went to a larger institution, did not have the kinds of opportunities that you have. I am so pleased with what we are trying to do here at Drake for you students. But we cannot do it alone. It's a partnership, and you've got to want it. So if nothing else, I'm going to be a ghost kind of hanging around, <laughs> seeing how you're engaging with difference. And if you ever want to just come to a home, which would be very different. For those of you who have been in my home, I've had my ex-mother-in-law said to me, how do white people feel when they come to your house? Because <laughs> everything is black. Everything. No. It, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> but, but that's me. So if you want to experience something different, just step out of your comfort zones, and it's going to be OK. And you're going to be much better for having experienced diversity broadly defined. We've come to the portion in our evening for the famous 10 questions. Now, Wanda, as you know, this is very short, brief, popcorn-style answers. <clears throat> no long elaborations. I am not allowed to ask any follow-up questions, so think of what you may want to ask her as a follow-up. OK, ready? Here we go. What is your favorite word? Empower. What is your least favorite word? Minority. What turns you on? He's not here. No, uh. <laughs>
Answer. Life. <laughs> what turns you off? Um, prejudice. What sound or noise do you love? The Drake Choir. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Bullets. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Just one quick elaboration. My mom says when I was a little bitty girl, I said this and it just blew her away. My hu ex-husband used to always tell me, don't try to curse because it just doesn't sound right. <laughs> and you're going to hear it. Shit. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I'm in the one. What profession would you not like to do? I think every profession has its dignity. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. At this time, we're going to open it up to the audience to ask your own questions that you have of Wanda. And feel free, we'll have some peers who are walking through, passing microphones, so that you'll have the opportunity to, s to ask. Let's thank Mandy for a wonderful job. Okay, as they're getting settled and getting uh, the mics around, I want you all to go back to your orientation because you know how I love to walk the stage. Faculty and staff, you've not been here at orientation, so we're going to do a review session with you <laughs> so we can bring you up to speed on what we typically do during orientation. If you saw early on um, this, the the three words, blood, sweat, and tears, okay? During orientation, I always try to emphasize to new families the importance, again, of recognizing difference, but also respecting our oneness. And so I will do this thing while I will say, <clears throat> and I will ask for a volunteer in the audience. We've got one here. Would you stand, please? <laughs> All right. And your name, please? Adam, okay, and I love the volume. Also, remember, always use volume because you have multi-generational issues in the audience, so not all of us can hear. Okay, <clears throat> Adam, if you were to cut me, what color is my blood? <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> what color is my blood? Red. Now, we always say, and we know healthcare professionals in the audience will say, well, tip is, you know, it really isn't red, but can we just all agree right now it's red? <laughs> okay. Then we will talk about looking at Adam and looking at Wanda. What do you see that's different? <laughs> that one always comes out. <laughs> but of course, it's not an obvious difference, correct? Right? Okay. So what we do is we identify and we go through that with blood. Thank you, Adam. Then we will do one with sweat because, again, in our society, oh, that one was representation of that which sustains life. Everyone in this room, in this state, in this nation, in this world as we know it, you have the exact same answer to the question, that which sustains life. Blood that runs through your veins, that runs through my veins, regardless of your age, gender, sexual orientation, background, where you're from, all of us, 
when you look at that bottom line, that which sustains life is the exact same color. Then we do a thing about sweat. And we talk about how in our society there's a connotation of sweat and hard work. And we think about if your sweat glands are operational, we each have the same response to the color of sweat. That's the clear one, Adam. <laughs> <clears throat> And the third we talk about when we talk about tears, tears of joy, tears of sorrow. All of our tears, regardless of the wonderful ways in which we are different, they are the exact same color. So that's where the blood, sweat, and tears, the three things that matter the most, sustain life, hard work, and our emotions. So if we understand that from the standpoint of our oneness, then we can really then delve into what we consider in terms of our differences. So that's just a review session. So everyone now up to speed on blood, sweat, and tears. Also, I say to students and I say to all of you, in this life you have choices. When you work with me, and I hope this will be a legacy that will continue when I am gone, that in these choices in life, either I call on you or you volunteer. So faculty, I want you to know that is something that I have said to every student coming through, that being able to use your voice, your voices are powerful. And understanding the importance of voice and opportunities to engage and interact with faculty, you get that here at Drake. Questions, why that three letter word is probably the most powerful question always ask why. Now I know those of you who are parents and you have young ones and I'm looking at Carrie, she's probably, okay, why, 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 why? You want to say, just because I said so. Nah, why is so powerful because they're thinking, they're being curious. So questions, that's what we're going to do now. So we've set the stage. If I don't get any questions, I'm going to call on you. Love it, there's a hand, okay, we've got one here too. All right, great. All right, I would like for you to project, even though you have a microphone, wanna make sure that everyone can hear you. Say your name, please, and then what is your question? Okay, my name is Carly Kinsler, and I'm sure you've been expecting this question. It's one that you've asked me, and I'm sure many individuals in this room numerous times, but I could not resist the opportunity to ask, Wanda, who are you? Give you a context. I love the, <laughs> I love the author, <clears throat> Marsha Baxter Magolda, and she talks about journey towards self-authorship. And she talks about there are three dimensions when we talk about our holistic approach of looking at students. One is the epistemological dimension, how we know how we learn to believe what we do. The second dimension is the intrapersonal. Who are you as an individual? And the third is the interpersonal, how you construct relationships with others. So in my classes, and, in, and if you've been in Adams Academy, I've done the who are you? And it's a question that's just, because you keep asking, who are you? So I want you to go home tonight and do that with your husbands and wives or significant others and with each other. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? So I want you all, in, in, as an audience, ask me and I will respond. Who are you? Wanda. Who are you? Short. Who are you? Loving. Who are you? Caring. Who are you? Mad. Who are you? Um, sorry. Who are you? So do you get the gist? And then what typically happens, and I do this with corporate America. I love doing it with corporate America. You do this for a brief period of time first, and most of the answers are very surface. If you'll notice, I was giving you descriptors. Then when you do it the next time, then have them go 15 minutes. And students who have been in my class, you know that's torture. <laughs> who are you? Who are you? You start getting at a very def different depth because you're really thinking about, yeah, what am I? Who am I? And then the 30-minute one, is really revealing. A lot of good things come out of that because you really are examining 
who you are. So thanks, Carly. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, your energy. <laughs> Maintain that. Wanda, my name is Joshua Poindexter. But first, I really just wanted to thank you for being with us tonight and sharing your evening. Thank you. I was hoping that you could talk about a life mistake that you have made and how that has influenced you. A life mistake. Um, wow. I'll tell you why I'm hesitating on that. Not that I don't want to answer, um, because I think every experience adds value. Um, and even if it may have, it may seem like a bad decision, at that time, when you reflect on it and look back, it added something to who, who you are. Probably um, when I came to Drake initially, um, I did not get involved on campus. And I know you weren't just talking about Drake specifically, but that's where I think I made my mistake when I didn't get involved in more areas than just my black power. I mean, black power was all over me, right, Diane Callback? <laughs> um, <laughs> Diane, <clears throat> for, for the students of our class, we just celebrated our 40th um, reunion. And I think I was probably known as the great big Afro, black power, don't mess with her. <laughs> that, and that was intentional. I didn't want you all to mess with me. I wanted to be intimidating, and it worked. Um, but I really didn't take time to, to learn more about my passions, um, and I was more singularly focused. So I probably, and that's why I hope all of you will do different kinds of things while you're here, um, and use those as opportunities not only to figure out what's important to you, but also you're helping others learn about a different way of thinking or a different perspective. So that's, that's probably a, a failure and as much money, even then it was, Drake was expensive. Not anything like it is now, but for the, for the dollar at that point, it was very expensive. So I would say take advantage of all the opportunities, but yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? I guess I'm up next. Oh. Uh, Wanda, my name is Peter Ryan. Um, so let's uh, take a quick moment back in time and go back. How far back? Not <laughs> go back to like your 18-year-old self. Um, do you think, you're, as you're an 18-year-old self, do you think you could ever have influenced this many people in your lifetime? Well, you have to know that at 18, I was in a group called the Shades of Soul. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I played the keyboard and was also <laughs> vocals wore the short, very short, so all of you think it's short skirts or something now? Oh, we've been there. <laughs> um, blue satin dresses and popped our fingers and danced on stage. And so um, we were hired out to do several different, I mean, from Ames at Iowa State to here in the city. So uh, they were like old men though and old people. So, I don't know how much influence we had, but um, no, not to the extent that I, no, but not at 18, but at least at 18, I thought I was impacting an audience. <laughs> Good question, thank you. Yes. Okay, um, I'm Nicole German, and I, my question for you is, as college students, we're all preparing ourselves for what's after Drake, so what's for you after Drake? Ooh. For one year, and those of you who have, have heard me say this, so I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. For one year, I am doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to sit in the house and do nothing, but I mean, I'm not making any commitments for committees or boards. I want to just figure out Wanda at this point. What, what is my passion? What do I want to do? Um, 
I also want to, I've been talking with my niece, I want to go uh, to the Grand Canyon, not been there before. I want to go out on the East Coast and Maine during the fall of the year. I want to experience nature and connect with nature without necessarily being in it. I don't like <laughs> bugs. I don't. So we're talking about from a bed and breakfast or, you know, so we're not talking about physically being in it. But, um, and then I will probably do some consulting work. I love that at some point. So um, finding the next stage of Wanda. I love seasons. I believe in seasons. And so this is my season to sort of reconnect with who I am, what I want to do, and just enjoy the moment. How are we on time? Okay. Any more questions? Oh. Do you have a microphone? I, I have one. Wanda, to your left. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, over here. Okay. Uh, Oops. My name is Alex Hoops. <laughs> we served on a task force together once or something like that. Yeah. Um, I know that you talked about the, the PMAC program. I think a lot of students associate you with the PMAC program. Um, other than uh, retention rates improving, what do you think have been some of the other lasting impacts of that program, and where do you hope to see it go after, after you have gone? Specifically that program? Yeah, specifically that program. Okay. Um, what I have found, and I'm, I'm not going to pick on Jennifer McCricket, who I, I think is just a, a dear, dear person, uh, but I think faculty have developed a respect for, and she's always felt that way about students and what they can contribute, but I think faculty have a different level of respect for how students can engage. Um, and I'm, I see Doug Hillman back there who's also been a strong supporter of student involvement and engagement. And I don't know, I'm not just saying it's just the PMAX, it's just solely, but how students um, play a very instrumental role in the success of other students, but also students educating faculty. Faculty are very knowledgeable in their fields of study. They have wonderful experiences, but they also learn a lot from students. And so PMAX, Peer Mentor Slash Academic Consultant, for those of you who are not aware of the acronym, they really, we, we talk with them a lot and give them opportunities to engage with faculty outside of class. So I think that level of respect, as well as I think students always, but PMAX in particular, pull faculty, staff, and students together. I have loved over the last few years how it really has become a community of faculty, staff, and students working together. That doesn't happen on a lot of college campuses, that mutual respect. I look at Melissa Sturm Smith and I think about when she talks about co-curricular kinds of ways in which we engage with students outside of class, but they complement the classroom environment. So there is a lot going on and students, you have been powerful in making that happen. The peer advisory board, and Alex served on the peer advisory board, and I think you went for a second term, didn't you? You really were glutton for punishment. Um, <laughs> with me, because they have to meet, the board meets with me once a week, and we spend quality time. We have a great time, but they plan everything for Welcome Weekend and beyond. I want you to know, if you serve on the peer advisory board, you have an obligation and a responsibility that when they go to apply for jobs, people cannot believe that they've had that level of responsibility of making it a strong and successful transition for first students coming to, first year students coming to college. So the impact, Alex, in answer to your question, is far reaching and I think ways in which we have not even imagined. But that whole notion of peers taking responsibility and conducting themselves as professionals. Those of you who know me know I feel strongly about you're always representing not only yourselves, but you represent the institution. And we wanna make sure that when you graduate, people will say, 
you're a Drake graduate, I could tell, because you know how to have fun, but boo, you can flip a switch in a moment and put on as much professionalism as you need to, not just to impress, but because that's just the way you are. So, did you get the microphone? Yes. Um, my name is Tian Pham, and um, my question is regarding about the w your path to your PhD degrees. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose to pursue the degree, and what did you want to do with the degree? And may I channel your answer into some personal aspect of um, the reason why, aside from the fact that that's the higher degrees that you can get and uh, um, the opportunities behind that. Mm. Whoa. Um, <coughs> I wanted it, I've always loved education. So um, I did not miss a day of school from kindergarten to 12th grade. Did not miss a day. My brother said, well, he wasn't here yet, but he can vouch for it. Um, did not miss a day, perfect attendance. School has always been something I've loved. But the PhD was really sort of a, um, I wasn't thinking about it each step of the way, but when I came to Drake to work at Drake, I did not have my PhD at that time. And I noticed that even though, and again, this goes back to influence of faculty, even though faculty were supportive and paid attention, I just noticed I didn't have the same level of respect. And when I finally earned my PhD, now understand I worked full time the whole time I was working on that. I know every cow and blade of grass between here and Ames, Iowa. <laughs> my husband left during that time. I developed a heart condition during that time and I still got in my little car and drove up that highway every day to make it happen. And when I had people say to me, well, don't worry about, you know, and this has actually been said to me, not a lot of black people get PhDs anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, you, know, you all know my personality now. You don't think I can? Then that was another motivator. But soon as I earned that PhD, I was saying the exact same things before I got that PhD that I said after, and there was a different level of respect that I got from the faculty. And I'm not saying that I was trying to please them, but it was just something important to me because I admire the work that they do. And to be able to have that same sort of ticket in was important, but I also just loved learning because I was able to apply everything I was studying because my PhD is in higher education with an emphasis on academic affairs, academic administration. And so being able to come back on campus when I'm taking classes in Crystal and, and Melissa are doing that now, that was the best thing I could have done because applying the knowledge, then going back to class and saying, okay, those of you who have not worked, you've just gone to school, straight through, L let me school you here, uh, because this is how it really is. Uh, but no, so I don't know if I'm answering your question. I had a number of different, but it was really my own intrinsic motivation that I wanted to do that because I love education. So it wasn't just so I can say doctor, because you notice I don't, you all call me Wanda. But Dr. Everidge, for my family, for black people the, who know me or don't know me, the pride that I see in their faces when they know that there is a PhD who when I come, when I go back to Alton, it's just like some kind of queen, which I'm not, but it really does, there's that sense of pride because very few are able to do that. So it's not that they don't have the ability, it's they don't necessarily have the opportunity. And I had the opportunity and I wanna make sure that I share that. One more, one more question. Okay. Hi, Wanda. Kevin Keel, class of 2009. Kevin! <laughs> um, as you depart Drake, uh, what hopes do you have for the university and what improvements do you hope will be made uh, to make this institution even greater? I hope that um, we will stay about 
this size, or maybe I think size matters. I hope that um, faculty will continue to make teaching their priority. Um, I hope we will become more diverse in terms of our student population and faculty and staff, physical attributes as well as thinking and backgrounds. I hope that Drake will be more intimately involved with the neighborhood and with the community. I hope that Drake will continue to strive for excellence and not take anything for granted in terms of being secondary to no one. I hope that Drake will be a place where people will want to contribute their dollars to make this a better place for the students coming along behind us. And I hope that Drake will continue to nurture and nourish the whole notion of being global and provide people opportunities to not only travel abroad, but travel here in the United States and do some wonderful work because you are Drake graduates. That's what I hope. And I believe it can happen, or I wouldn't stand here saying that to you. So it can. You already have a wonderful foundation for it to happen. But just getting people in here who are as committed as the current staff and those who are in faculty and those who are not committed, push them, challenge them. Students, I want you to challenge your professors. I want you to make them work for what little they get. Uh, I want you, oh yeah, that's the other, I hope salaries will increase. Um, <laughs> but you can tell they're here not just for the money, they're here for you because we are educating the world. And I hope this will continue to be the best place to learn because it has certainly been for me. So thank you. Okay, I've been given just a few moments for closing remarks. <clears throat> and I've been thinking about how I want to leave this institution. I want to leave this institution with hopefully your thinking about how you're going to touch someone else's lives how you are seeing yourselves as individuals, individuals and collectively as a community. Because when I think about our future, and remember early on when, I, when the question was asked, who are you, and I said, I'm angry. I'm angry because this world is not fair. This world is not forgiving. This world is not accessible. This world is not what it can and should be. I want each of you to make your own personal commitment about what you can do to make sure that those young lives, when I see little kids and I see in their eyes the joy of life, and then you see them at about 16, and they're angry, and they're sad. There's something wrong. And I don't live in pie in the sky and think everything is just going to be wonderful, but it can be so much better. And it's not someone else's responsibility. It always gets me when people either physically point their finger at someone else or they are doing it by judging someone else. You should do this, and you should do that, and you should stop doing that, and you should go back to your own country. I always love that when they say, look how many fingers are pointing back at you, and how many are pointing out at someone else. There are more coming back at you. Are you the problem, or are you going to be part of the solution? So it's very easy to place blame. It's much more difficult to take responsibility. I want you each to commit to taking responsibility. Drake can be such a place where people want to come 
not just for any partying or not just because they've heard about it, because they can sense this is a place that is going to nurture your growth and development. You are the future. I don't know if you could hear when the, one of the songs I selected to go along with the, um, the video, or whatever you call it now. Is it the video? Am I still okay? Am I in the 21st century? Um, is Whitney Houston's greatest love of all when she says, I believe that children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how it used to be. Now, you know in that song, she says, make it easier. No one promised you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's going to be easy. But it's easier if you have a sense of pride in who you are and don't let anyone make you feel less than because of who you are. You are blessed with the gifts that you have. Don't let anyone make you feel that you need to do this or that to be accepted, especially if you know it's wrong. And what I love, and of course, life is not about just right and wrong, but you know when you're doing something that's detrimental to you. It hurts me when I say I feel sorry. I'm sorry when people elect alcohol and other mood-altering drugs is what they, this, that's the choice every weekend that you're doing that and getting yourself in that stupor. And please know I'm not talking to you as a parent. I am talking to you now as someone who cares deeply about who you are and what you can become. And what do you want people to remember about you? That you were not able to remember the next day what was going on? Or that you were really involved and engaged in going to guest lectures and going to the symphony and going to doing things that really help stimulate your mind rather than kill your nerves. I hope you are making wise choices and making informed choices because this short period of time is really a short period of time. And people will say, well, it's college. So, you know, you're supposed to do it. I'm not saying that you need to be a saint. All I'm saying is really think about how you are spending these precious four to six years, six years pharmacy, and then ask yourself, when you walk across that stage, and those of us who will be walking across that stage this year, 2012, and you look back, what do you want your reflection to show? Do you want it to show that you have added value to the lives around you? Or do you want it to show that you really were a problem and it was problematic? Anyone can change. Everybody can change. But you have an opportunity now to make a difference. You have been part of my journey. And I want you to know when you think about a journey, I want you to imagine a path. And each of you, and I love relays. You know when they do that at relays, when they do the victory lap? and people are clapping along the way, I want you to imagine that Wanda Everidge is making her victory lap, and each of you has contributed to my winning at Drake University. Each of you have played a part in my life, even if we have not connected directly. You have chosen Drake, and you've given me a chance to hopefully impart some kind of knowledge or wisdom. But that victory lap, please join me as I go along and I say, who is Michelle Laughlin in here? Because she always teases me and says, this is my farewell tour. Well, I just want you to imagine that I am running with that white flag and I'm a winner. And I am a winner because of you. I am a winner because God has evidently seen fit for me to be here with each of you. And it doesn't matter to me what color, shape, or size. Yes, you're beautiful. Each of you, you are beautiful. But what matters to me is what you have given 
given of yourself, given to me, given to others. So I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to say thank you as I never, ever imagined that these 24 years would be as beautiful as they have been with all of the hard times that I experienced. And to know that you all have embraced me in ways that just can't be expressed with words. Hopefully, thank you is enough. And hopefully you know that my thank you comes from every fiber of my being. Every breath I take, I owe it to those of you who have made my life so full. So my wish for you is that you have an experience where you know that you have made a difference. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On behalf of the Student Alumni Association and our Senior Week Committee, uh, in partnership with Student Senate and Delta Sigma Pi, uh, we would like to thank everyone for coming out and spending your Wednesday with Wanda. Um, tonight will certainly be a night to remember. Uh, we also want to thank all the faculty and staff who are here with us tonight, um, especially our administration, John Smith, our Vice President of Alumni and Development, uh, Sue Wright, our Interim Provost. Uh, before we end tonight, uh, we have one last announcement that we'd like to make. Since 1988, Wanda's passion has made students and families feel welcome at Drake. She has assisted countless students on their journeys to become better students, better citizens, and better people. So the Wanda E. Everidge Outstanding Peer Mentor Award will honor Wanda's passion for mentoring students and her dedication to empowering them to build meaningful relationships with their peers. Each year, this award will recognize a student who has made a significant impact on the Drake experience and personal life of another student. Beginning in spring of 2013, students will have the opportunity to nominate their peers for this prestigious award, which will be given out at the Leaders and Luminary Ceremony every spring. So we are honored, Wanda, that your legacy will live on at Drake for many years to come, and we want to thank you for everything that you've done for this university and the Drake community. So if we could have one more round of applause for Wanda. Thank you.